become the computing wizard of the 17th century in one hour is sort of a strange title if you think about it. The intent is to show that you know today much more than people did centuries ago. And you can do things in a very short amount of time that took them years to think about and to develop. We start out with something that, when I was introduced to it, was considered to be really trivial. Suppose you have an, uh, an X and you want to multiply A times A times A, you know, M times. And then you have a number Y, you multiply A times A N times, like November. Then X times Y, you just multiply all these A's together, which means they now occur M plus N times. So we could have written this uh, more compactly, X equal A to the M and Y is A to the N and X times Y is A to the M plus N. And there you have actually already the essence of logarithm in some sense. The, the, a key idea leading to logarithm is right displayed here. That is, if I call A a base and M a logarithm, then uh, M is the logarithm of X. It's really the ex exponent uh, of A. And similarly, N is the logarithm of Y. And M plus N is the logarithm of X times Y. Well, here you have a speed up in computation. If you are given X and Y, and you have a quick way of getting the numbers M and N, these two logarithms, then you add these two logarithms together and go back into your table or whatever you have, machinery, and you have computed X times Y. So what is happening is by the use of logarithm, we have replaced multiplication by addition, which is an extraordinary thing. Addition is very easy. Multiplication, if you have long numbers, is very painful. So years ago, I knew all this, of course, but then I stepped in a book on, uh, on the philosophy of mathematics by Wittgenstein, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he says there that this looks like some trivial notation, but it is actually very profound. And I thought, amazing. I thought it was really very trivial. And so uh, at the time I was working on a book on uh, mathematical history, uh, I got a book by Florian uh, Kajori about the title being the history of mathematical notation, an entire book just talking about mathematical notation, an amazing thing, I thought. So I started reading this book and it became clear to me how much notation has been a factor in the development of mathematics and that we are now at the tail end of an enormous development taken, that took place over centuries. And we're using all that. And when we look back, we say, why did it take these people so long? Well, we have this extraordinary notation. So let's pursue this more and see what that means relative to exactly this notation here. That notation was invented by René Descartes in, we know the year, 1637. He published a book, Discours de la Méthode. I don't want to go through what all this book does, but here is a appendix called La Géométrie. And in that appendix, he defines his notation that I just showed you. He does more. He actually lays the foundation for what later was called, that is the fundamental observations, what later was developed as a Cartesian coordinate system. So this is a very profound book, obviously. Well, I want to show you a bit of uh, the complications that people went through 
to uh, get to this concept of exponent notation that Descartes ultimately developed. And here is Diophantus. So we talk about uh, roughly two, 200 to 300. And he wrote 13 books. They are called Arithmetica. This is probably the most uh, important and most impressive mathematics book collection ever. It was printed since that time continuously, and some volumes are still printed today. So 1,700 years of reprinting is not a bad record. I show you a, here is something that occurs in his book. Now I have here times, the modern times and the modern equation that didn't exist, but these symbols are right taken from him. And the relationship that are right here is exactly what he wants to express. And you want to understand what this means. You can go into this table here which links this old notation of Diophantus with modern notation. So this capital delta to the epsilon is x squared, and this delta y, delta epsilon, delta is x to the four, and this kappa epsilon kappa is x to the sixth. So what he's really talking about is this x squared times y uh, x uh, to the fourth power is x to the sixth power. That's really what he's saying. But there is no evidence in this formula here that I somehow take exponents of two and four and add them up and get six. Not, not, none whatsoever in this formulation. There, there are more examples about what happened in, in variables. We're not going to do that. But there's an entirely separate and different and later development for exponents for, for constants. I pick only one case that is, uh, arises from the Greek system of numbers. The Greeks used the alphabet to express numbers. And alpha is one, beta is two, gamma is three, delta is four, and so forth. And this then goes on to, for the tens and the hundreds. And then there is a number m, the mu, the Greek mu, is the biggest number that you could express with one character. It's 10,000. And Apollonius of Perga came up with this notation. Mu with the superscript that alpha is 10 now today, is 10,000 to the first power, and mu with the superscript of beta is 10,000 to the second power, and so forth. So we don't see yet our general notation of Descartes. That, that came much later. Now let's turn to the decimal number system. When you trace the history of the decimal number system, you also see a large number of contributors. Normally, people say uh, Simon Stevin, 1548 to 1620, he did it. And here's his notation. 3, 4, 8, then a circled 0, 5, circled 1, 2, circled 2, and so forth, represents in modern notation 3, 4, 8, dot, 5, 2, 7, 9. You can see this highly redundant in that if you, if you know that zero, you don't need that one and two and three. I can count along here these digits and I can put in these circle things. But he didn't do that. He had this notation. And then that was simplifying on and on. In fact, a number of people before him and after him worked on how to handle the decimal number system, including the man that we will meet shortly, uh, Jost Berge. He came up with his own system and together with that system then rules how to operate with these numbers. So we are now at the following point. We don't have any notation for constants. We have a decimal number system that is slightly cumbersome, but can be improved. And shortly it will be improved. But that's all we really have. And we have the arithmetic of the decimal number system. Here comes our first person to move toward logarithm. 
Mike, Michael Stiefel is an extraordinary person, really, when you look at his uh, <laughs> bio. He was a priest, then became uh, joined Martin Luther, that is, he joined Protestantism. He studied mathematics, and at 1558, you know how old he was, 71 years old, he became the first professor of mathematics at a newly founded University of Vienna in Germany. In 1544, so that's prior to becoming a professor by 14 years, he published a groundbreaking book, Arithmetica Integra. Let's look at one passage of that book. There is a table in this book where that you can see the structure very quickly. Look at these numbers, one, two, four, eight. You always multiply by two, you see. Here, even for the smaller, for the fractions, one eighth, one fourth, one half, uh, one half. So you multiply by two all the time. On the top, zero, one, two, three, you see you always add one. So on the top, we add one. On the bottom, we multiply by two. And then he makes a very interesting observation. He says, with that, I can very cleverly reduce multiplication to addition. And it goes like that. Here's an example. I want to multiply one fourth by eight. What I do, I go on the table, under one fourth, I see a minus two above. By the way, he calls this minus two exposed. That's where the term exponent comes from. Michel Stiefel is the inventor of that term. So this is exponent minus two. Under the eight, I walk up and I have a three as an exponent. I multiply minus two and three, and I get plus one. I go for plus one and down here is two. And now I know one fourth times eight is equal to two. And then it demonstrates you can do division, you can take powers, and you take roots with this system. Of course, this is just a particular uh, situation, if you like, in that his table, even if you extend it all the way from plus to minus infinity, uh, doesn't have all the numbers that you would want to compute with. So, so that is an open situation that he did not resolve. Now, people after him copied this over. So you find in mathematics books at the time about arithmetic, you find this table in modified form, basic sometimes, but uh, basically you're looking at this table. So the next slide is telling you just what I said. That is, multiplication becomes addition, division becomes subtraction, and so forth. So what could one do with this? Well, one man was aware of this work, not maybe Stiefel's book, but other books. And he writes so. He doesn't make any claims of inventing this observation. And his name is Joost Berge. Now, Joost Berge is a demonstration that no matter how bad your start in life, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you work hard enough. He was born in a tiny little village in Switzerland, in Liechtenstein, And he went to elementary school and he learned rudimentary mathematics and basic writing. That's it. That's all of his education. He, in particular, he never learned Latin. And Latin was the language for science and mathematics. He could neither read it nor could he write it. And one time he, he had a friend translate an entire work of math in mathematics into German so he could read it, and he paid then with one of his famous clerks. That was his payment or remuneration or honorarium. But given this very bad start, he became an extraordinary scientist and mathematician. He made utterly precise clocks. He was the first one to build a clock that uh, ran in two second increments. Nobody knew how to do that. Other mechanisms, instruments, here is one, uh, proportional compass, first rate mathematicians. He computed sign tables with a precision that was uh, unknown at the time, with a new method he developed for computing sign values. 
And then the logarithm table we look at in a moment. He became an astronomer. He made the instruments and gave measurements to Kepler, whom we meet shortly, and was accepted as an equal in this group of Kepler and uh, Tycho Brahe and uh, was really an, a very well acknowledged scientist and mathematician. Here is his famous Himmels Globus. It's a beautiful work of art that allows you to determine the position of stars and planets at any point in time. Now, Berge left a table of logarithms and instructions how to use it. They're very terse. They neither tell you why the rules that he tells you are true, and he doesn't tell you how he developed all that. So what I thought to do is to go back, assume only knowledge of what Berge had, which it was a decimal number system and basic arithmetic, and see how he must have thought when he created all this wonderful material. Now, this is the only way, when you think about it, to understand what somebody has done. And, but this rule was considerably violated during the last 150 years when people looked seriously at Burgess' work and then reconstructed and whatever, using all sorts of things, like assuming that he probably knew the number E, 2.71 something, which was actually constructed by Jacob uh, Bernoulli in the second half of the uh, 16th century, uh, more than 50 years after Berge's death. So Berge didn't, never knew E, there's no question about it. But assuming just a decimal number system, basic arithmetic, we can think about how might he have thought about creating a table of logarithms that allowed you powerful computations. So the first thought would be that he only wants to construct numbers between 1 and 10. Because any other number for which he has the logarithm, for any other number, he can scale down into that range. So that's the first rule or principle. The second principle is his exponents he has as integers 0, 1, 2, 3. So his logarithms are really integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. And there is a base b here. And so the numbers which are constructed with these exponents, that is y equal to b to the x power, they should also go up as x grows. So it's a monotonic increasing number of y's. And that means the base has to be bigger than 1. But then the base has to be so clever that you can easily compute these numbers y. Remember, these are multiplications, b times b times b. So in multiplication in general is very cumbersome, but it must be very easy because he knows he will have to compute thousands of them. Here comes number three, the third principle. There must be enough numbers, why? Between one and 10, so that if you are missing a number in that list, you can find the logarithm by interpolation. So if you have a number that lies between two given numbers, say right in the middle of it, then you take the middle of the two logarithm values and you simply declare that to be the logarithm. But it must be so that this primitive process gives you still very high accuracy. We will see in a moment what accuracy he was striving for. Now he says, I do the following. I come up with a base of the form 1.0000 and then 1. The number of zeros he leaves open. He says, let's leave that open. How many zeros I have in between? But there's just the one, a bunch of zeros, and then another one. That's it. That's my base. By this very ingenious choice, the creation of these numbers is very simple. Let me give you an example. Suppose we take this space the base 1.0001. And suppose you already have computed 1.001 to the 3500th power. This turns out to be this number, 1.419 and so forth. 
a total of nine digits, you see, and that's what he actually created later, nine digit numbers. The next number is to the exponent 3501, of course, you know, one, one uh, up in the exponent, which means it's this base times the number you have already computed, which is 1001 times 1 1.41 and so forth. So you have to see how you do this multiplication. But that's the kid stuff. You write down the number, you write it below, and move with four positions to the right to accommodate this factor here. You add these two things and you're done. So what is happening to go from one number to the next is not a multiplication. It's a very simple addition where you know exactly which two numbers have to be added. Ingenious, isn't it? This thought that he had. Now you say, well, if you know anything about computing, if you do this for a while, there will be, since you're rounding back uh, away these uh, failing digits here, there will be a round of error and it quickly will overwhelm the position that you're striving for. The way you guard against that is the numbers that you are actually computing are much larger or significantly larger. You, add, you carry more digits, really. And it turns out if you carry two more digits, that's actually good enough to combat round of error. And then you have to do intermediate checks and so forth. I ignore all that. You just know that in principle, you only have to do addition for each step. Let's do that, and we will use this table later, by the way, for the biggest of these bases, that is 1.1, no intermediate zeros. Here's the logarithm, 0, 1, 2, 3, 12, 14, and here are the values, 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1, 1, 1, and so forth. And uh, after you have 24, you got this number here, and then you go to 25 and you blow past 10. So by interpolating between the 25 and the 24, you get a number for 10, and it's just approximately. So now you have a logarithm table that has 25 entries in it. And you say, how good is that table? Well, again, we now have to only consider, we can only use something that Berger had available to evaluate this, because he had no graphing of functions or anything. None of this existed at the time, none whatsoever. But we know he could have estimated quite cleverly by you taking a square root of a square root of a square root. That's all the technology needed. And he knew how to take a square root. That was well uh, in hand at the time for decimal numbers. And given that, with a bit of work, he estimates the error, the, ma the max error, when you interpolate, to be 0 0.0012. This is easily computed. This whole effort, including the error computation, will take at most 10 minutes. Five minutes to make the table, maybe five minutes to figure this out, and you're done. Now, he, I told you, he went for nine digits. So here only, you know, if, if you say, well, I allow a variation of one, I tolerate that. He really has three digit precision. So he says that is not good enough. Let me now insert zeros here. 1.1, 1 1.01, 1 .1, 001, 001, 001. You see, I insert more and more zeros. And for each one, I do the error calculation. It's not difficult to do. In a matter of minutes, you have figured that out. Burgi would have figured that out. And the accuracy, you know, allowing a one here, you say is still accurate enough in that position, you get accuracy of three, five, seven, nine, eleven digits. Now he says, of course, I would love to have eleven digit precision, but how much do I have to compute? Now you can estimate how many cases you have. Here we had 24, discounting the first last case, and you easily estimate that here it's take 240. 2,400, 24,000, 240,000 you have to do. Here are the exact numbers. He didn't know those. But the 24, 240,000 is a pretty good estimate, actually. In here, you realize, or Berger realizes, he cannot do this. A quarter million additions is out of range. There's no way he can pull this off. He won't be able to print the table either. 
But he says, I'm good enough, I can do 23,000 or 24,000, he estimated. And now people have gone through, uh, particularly in Switzerland, uh, Jörg Waldvogel went through and said, Let me, let's estimate how long it took him to do this. And they came up with between one and three months, between one and three months, he pulled this off creating a logarithm table for this base here. Astonishing, really, when you think about it, that you could do that. This in contrast to John Napier, whom I mentioned before, who required years and years of effort. The same for Henry Briggs, whom we won't even get into, who took years and years and years to compute the logarithm tables. He does his thing time between one and three months. Extraordinary, really. Now, here is his table. Well, not exactly, but we're going to look at it as if this was his table. His table is a little bit different. He only has integers. I mentioned that before. And so the these numbers here are integers for him. Instead of one or oh, oh, whatever he has is the the period is missing here. Everywhere this period is missing. He just has these as integers. And then he adds a zero to each one of these. Very weird, actually. People have puzzled about why he added a zero to each one of them. In the book that I mentioned later, I have a conjecture why he did that. And here's a decimal point that actually is one position more in his table. But let's ignore the decimal point thing. We are looking at his table, really, the substance of his table. And why he used integers here has a very nice explanation why this is all then in integers that I don't want to get into. We, we act as if he had these decimal points. Constructed in between one and three months. Now, I want to show you, and with this table, of course, you now can do uh, multiplication by addition, of course, you know, by this table. Let me go back. Uh, by this table, you do very quickly, you do complicated multiplication by addition. Not only that, because we had nine-digit uh, precision, nine-digit precision before, he knows that even when I interpolate, I will always have nine-digit precision. Do you think that's an accident that he computed nine-digit numbers? No way. No way this is an accident. There were so many choices to choose from, but he did that exactly knowing that interpolation would not harm him. Oops, why is this thing kicking around? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What happened here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, folks. There is a, here, here I am. Okay. Now, we are not going to look at this table of logarithms. I gave it to you in slightly modified form, but I want to look at the title page and an implication we can draw from that title plate, title page. It's a work of art. Let's look at it. On the outside are red numbers. These are the logarithms. All the logarithms in a spacing of the first one is, well, the should say zero. He doesn't have it here, but it's 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. Well, I told you, he has one zero more. In our scale table, it's 500,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. You go all the way around, you end up with 23,027, you see? That's where for the 10, for the number 10. And he has even spacing of that. That's very important. They all in, they go up in increments of 500 in terms of the scale table. On the inside are what he calls the black numbers. These are the integers. We always have a decimal point after the first thing. So here is under 1500 for us is 1.16 1. Uh, and so forth. It's a little bit hard to read. Given this title page. People looked at it since 1850 and said, 
this actually looks like the precursor of a circular slide rule something. Indeed, it does. And I dare claim that he was aware of that. This, this is no secret that he didn't understand. He had constructed scaling mechanisms. He had constructed all sorts of stuff. He surely saw the implication of this drawing here. And the implication, oh, sorry, sorry. I need to go back uh, to address one other issue before we come to the implication of that. He computed this around 1600, somewhere between 1600 for the latest 1609. Published it in 1620. 20 years went before he published that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. If he had published that in a timely fashion, he would have been number one inventor of the logarithm. As it was, he was scooped by uh, John Napier, who in 1614 published a table of logarithm and then was declared to be the unique inventor of logarithm. And when he came in 1620, it was too late. This upset his, the man who had worked with actually for many years, Kepler. Johannes Kepler, famous mark of the orbits of the planet with ellipses. You know, just a fantastic intellectual achievement who used Berge's logarithm table and sign tables in his work. He wrote, he created a book called the Rudolphine Tables, which were a landmark of astronomy used for centuries. That book allowed you to compute the position of any major star and planets for any point in time seen from any position on Earth. He had a huge collection of cities with latitude and longitude in there. So you looked up your city and then you could compute where will Mars be on that date at that time. An incredible piece of science. That book doesn't mention much Berge, except in one paragraph. Berge, here he is, Justus Georgius. And here's this paragraph in Latin. Now, this is hard to decipher, but there is a man, Ian Bruce, who has done beautiful translation of many of these Latin pieces, an enormous contribution to science. And Bruce's translation is here. Such logistic numbers discussed in the preceding sentence led used to focus to the very same logarithms many years to the appearance of Napier system. But he, a hesitant man and guardian of his secrets, abandoned the child at birth and didn't raise it for common benefit. So there are two complaints of Kepler. First, he didn't publish it in time. And number two, he didn't do anything with it. Too bad, really. So let's now see the implication of this title page. Look at a shaded angle here. Here is the same size shaded angle. The first shaded angle goes from the logarithm from 0 to 2,500. And this goes from uh, 6,000 uh, 6, to 8,500. So what you do, if you multiply, if you take the black number here, multiply it by 1.00012 to that power 2,500, you get that number. Similarly, if you take that black number here and multiply it by, again, 1.0001 to the 2500, you get this number. In other words, if I want to multiply, I first construct an angle of the size of the first number, position it at the second number, and I read off the product of the two numbers. Surely Bergen knew this. It's impossible that he didn't see this. Why didn't he do that? There's a very simple explanation. The computation wouldn't be precise enough. There is no way with any reasonable sized uh, circular disk that you get nine digit precision, which we thought was mandatory for the uh, calculations in astronomy. That must be the reason why he never pursued this. 
he never thought that engineers didn't need nine digits. They were actually interested in much less. He never thought about that. He was wrapped up in astronomy. Here is a demonstration. This is a graphics trust. You take the black circle, you put one time uh, ring, and then inside, scale down, you put the black uh, ring again, and you imagine you can twist them against each other, and then you uh, can do multiplication. Here is uh, a work of art. <laughs> In Lexan, it is done, and it uh, demonstrates that this could actually have been done directly from his table. And uh, here is the 1.00 on the outer disk in yellow. And here you get 1.00 for a back number. Then you go here to the second number you want to multiply. And on the outside, you get the product of the two numbers. And this works with some reasonable precision. I say reasonable because this is not really very precise uh, the way the graphics was done. But in principle, you can see that this works. Instead of Berge doing this, this was done in 1632. That is 12 years after Berge published his uh, logarithm table by William Ortred. There's a William Ortred Society in the United States that uh, has collected much information about Ortred and other people involved in slide rule and slide this and so forth. And they provided this beautiful picture here that I had. So here's William Ortrud, and he invented this guy. Can you see how this works? You first set the angle using these two arms for one, and then you move jointly move these two uh, angles by only moving the lower one, and then you have multiplication. Very easy. This is 1632, so 12 years after Berge published his table. But actually, the slide rule goes much earlier. It is 1621. Edmund Gunther came up with the following idea. He was a colleague of Henry Briggs, and Briggs came up with a base 10 logarithm table, published it later. And so this information of Henry Briggs came to Gunther. And he said, why don't I do what we would now say Berge did in a, on a ring and simply linearly write it down. This is called Gunther's ruler. And it has the logarithm values on one side, and here are the red numbers, if you like, and the black numbers are here on these scales for various types of operations he wants to do. And he said the following, this is Gunther. He said, I can do the following. Suppose I want to multiply 1.284 times 1.822. I take a non-collapsing compass and measure the distance from 1.0 to that first factor. Then I set one leg of that compass on the second factor and the second leg to the right, and I can see the result, 2.329. So you needed that ruler and you needed the non-collapsing compass. This is 1621. Uh, 20, 20, 16, oh, one year after Bogey. So he could have beaten this too. And in 1622 comes Ortrud and says, oh, I can do better than this. I do take two Gunther rulers side by side, and by moving a second scale, you can move without compute, without use of a compass. And so he invented the slide rule. No question, William Ortrud, inventor of slide rule and circular slide disk. No, no question about it. I want to show you how important this was, these, these inventions. Let's say the whole thing started in 1620, to keep it uh, easy. For more than 350 years, people designed and redesigned and invented to improve this idea of adding distances to achieve multiplication. Here's one from the Toward the end of the 19th century, Thatcher's cylindrical slide rule, a patented slide rule. It's uh, two feet long. You know, this is a hefty slide rule. The scale zigzags 
down back and forth on the outside and on these triangular slats on the outside and on the cylinder on the inside for a total length of 10 yards. That's a lot, you know. So you, you had a very high rate of precision. So this is one case. And here's the smallest case, or very small case, a pocket watch, KL1, which is really two burgy discs or rings back to back, really. This is the front side, this is the back side, if you like, or the other way around, doesn't really matter. And one of these discs is fixed, and the other one you can rotate with this little knob, and these two pointers are connected, and you rotate them with the other knob, and so you can set things, the two uh, discs relative to each other, and you can rotate the arrows, and with that, you can add distances and do multiplication by addition. This whole invention process was still going on when I was a student in engineering school. You can see this some time ago. Uh, but in 1976, it was over. Commercial production of all slide rules, slide this, whatever you want to call it, quit right then in that year. First low cost, low cost electronic pocket calculator, less than $30. And it was over for slide rules. That was the end of it. So from 1620 to 1976, slide rules were the big thing. Slide disks to do effective and quick multiplication and division and so forth. All right. At the beginning of the talk, I promised that you could be a computing wizard within an hour. And so I will demonstrate that to you now. I do it for the base B1.1. So I use Burgess' ingenious construction of the slide rule, uh, of, of, sorry, of the logarithm table. First, I construct this table here. And I can do that. If, if you think about it, since this is just successive addition, you see, you always take a number, then slide it uh, below one position to the right, and then add these two numbers. You, you see, this is nothing. Within five minutes, you're done, including this interpolation. So in the first five minutes of your hour, you have made this. Now comes uh, a process that uh, is also easy, but takes a little bit longer. Down here, I'm writing these logarithm values, 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 25. And over here, I write the 1.1 to that power, to that uh, exponent, 1.0, 1.1, and so forth. But I always only use one, uh, write down one digit after the decimal point. Yeah, the rest, I simply drop off. So I write this down here. Write this here. Here they are. And now I try to, this is not a very nicely usable scale. I want to convert that. I find the position for one. Well, that's 1.0. For two, I have to interpolate for 1.9 and 2.1, and I get two. For three, I interpolate between 2.9 and three, I get three. And can you see I do that? This is not very painful, of course, very quick. And I get my 10. And then, here I have actually 1.5, I have the midpoint. For 2.5, I have to compute it by interpolation, and I do it here. But here, I just measure the distance between these two things, and uh, here I can take the direct value. But later, when I have not the precise number, I interpolate to put these pointers down. All right, now I take this scale here, and I write it down again. And I go in my shop and I glue these two things onto two wood strips, which I have created on my uh, table saw. And then I have a slide rule. Uh, here's a demonstration. I want to mul multiply two. I have a two here. I go up by one, two by three, and I get six. So this slide rule works, no question about it. Like two by five gives me 10. 
Now, you say, well, that's an hour. And I grant you that's a little bit crude. But in an hour, I have a demonstration that this actually works. Now, if you want to construct a slide rule that people would have found useful, it would take you a day, I would estimate. And I go from a factor of 1.1 to 1.01. And that means you do about 240 additions. It's not so bad when you think about it. And then you go through the process I just went through before this, uh, yeah, this manual thing. I go through that with interpolation and everything done graphically. And when I construct my slide rule, I have one that is more or less at the level of accuracy of a slide rule that I worked with as a student. And it would have taken a day for Berge to do this. Now, if you want to have a nice engraving, it's going to take longer. Probably it takes you maybe another day or two days to engrave this nicely. But imagine he would have shown up with this thing. He would have said, I can multiply very fast and divide very fast and compute exponents and all that stuff in no time. That people would have been astonished. And he would have, this, the print, printing instructions for making this thing would have been a bestseller for sure. Well, good people, I have given you an overview here. You may have seen note numbers on a, on a bunch of these graphics. And this is mandatory because people are giving me these pictures. And there's always a requirement that I have to cite them correctly, that this is the source of these pictures. Well, I don't want to do that here in, in the show, slideshow. So instead, I'm doing the following. I'm telling you, here's this book, out of which, I, about which I've talked here, a small portion of that book. And in there, when you take these note numbers, you look them up and you find all the justification for all the graphics and whatever is all there. Okay, and with that, I'm done.